This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. At the Back of the North Wind by George MacDonald Chapter 10 I have now come to the most difficult part of my story. And why? Because I do not know enough about it. And why should I not know as much about this part as about any other part? For, of course, I could know nothing about the story except Diamond had told it. And why should Diamond tell about the country at the back of the North Wind, as well as about his adventures in getting there? Because, when he came back, he had forgotten a great deal, and what he did remember was very hard to tell. Things there are so different from things here. The people there do not speak the same language for one thing. Indeed, Diamond insisted that there they do not speak at all. I do not think he was right, but it may well have appeared so to Diamond. The fact is, we have different reports of the place from the most trustworthy people. Therefore, we are bound to believe that it appears somewhat different to different people. All, however, agree in a general way about it. I will tell you something of what two very different people have reported, both of whom knew more about it, I believe, than Herodotus. One of them speaks from his own experience, for he visited the country, the other from the testimony of a young peasant girl who came back from it for a month's visit to her friends. The former was a great Italian of noble family, who died more than five hundred years ago, the latter a Scotch shepherd, who died not forty years ago. The Italian, then, informs us that he had to enter that country through a fire so hot that he would have thrown himself into boiling glass to cool himself. This was not Diamond's experience, but then Durante, that was the name of the Italian, and it means lasting, for his books will last as long as there are enough men in the world worthy of having them. Durante was an elderly man, and Diamond was a little boy, and so their experience must be a little different. The peasant girl, on the other hand, fell fast asleep in a wood, and woke in the same country. In describing it, Durante says that the ground everywhere smelt sweetly, and that a gentle even-tempered wind, which never blew faster or slower, breathed in his face as he went, making all the leaves point one way, not so as to disturb the birds in the tops of the trees, but on the contrary, sounding a bass to their song. He describes also a little river, which was so full that its little waves, as it hurried along, bent the grass full of red and yellow flowers through which it flowed. He says that the purest stream in the world, beside this one, would look as if it were mixing with something that did not belong to it, even although it was flowing ever in the brown shadow of the trees, and neither sun nor moon could shine upon it. He seems to imply that it is always the month of May in that country. It would be out of place to describe here the wonderful sights he saw, for the music of them is in another key from that of this story, and I shall therefore only add from the account of this traveller that the people there are so free and so just and so healthy that every one of them has a crown like a king and a mitre like a priest. The peasant girl, Kilmeny was her name, could not report such grand things as Durante, for, as the shepherd says, telling her story as I tell Diamond's, Kilmeny had been she knew not where, and Kilmeny had seen what she could not declare. Kilmeny had been where the cock never crew, where the rain never fell, and the wind never blew, but it seemed as the harp of the sky had rung, and the airs of heaven played round her tongue, when she spoke of the lovely forms she had seen, and a land where sin had never been, a land of love and a land of light, withouten sun or moon or night, where the river swayed a living stream, 
and the light a pure and cloudless beam, and the land a vision it would seem, and still an everlasting dream. The last two lines are the shepherd's own remark, and a matter of opinion. But it is clear, I think, that Kilmeny must have described the same country as Durante saw, though, not having his experience, she could neither understand nor describe it so well. Now I must give you such fragments of recollection as Diamond was able to bring back with him. When he came to himself after he fell, he found himself at the back of the north wind. North wind herself was nowhere to be seen. Neither was there a vestige of snow or of ice within sight. The sun, too, had vanished. But that was no matter, for there was plenty of a certain still, rayless light. Where it came from he never found out, but he thought it belonged to the country itself. Sometimes, he thought, it came out of the flowers, which were very bright, but had no strong color. He said the river, for all agree, that there is a river there, flowed not only through but over grass, its channel instead of being rock, stones, pebbles, sand, or anything else, was of pure meadow grass, not over long. He insisted that if it did not sing tunes in people's ears, it sung tunes in their heads. In proof of which, I may mention that, in the troubles which followed, Diamond was often heard singing, and when asked what he was singing, he would answer, one of the tunes the river at the back of the north wind sung. And I may as well say at once that Diamond never told these things to any one but, no, I had better not say who it was, but whoever it was told me, and I thought it would be well to write them for my child readers. He could not say he was very happy there, for he had neither his father nor mother with him, but he felt so still and quiet and patient and contented that, as far as the mere feeling went, it was something better than mere happiness. Nothing went wrong at the back of the north wind. Neither was anything quite right, he thought. Only everything was going to be right some day. His account disagreed with that of Durante, and agreed with that of Kilmeny, in this that he protested there was no wind there at all. I fancy he missed it. At all events, we could not do without wind. It all depends on how big our lungs are, whether the wind is too strong for us or not. When the person he told about it asked whether he saw anybody he knew there, he answered, Only a little girl belonging to the gardener who thought he had lost her, but was quite mistaken, for there she was, safe enough, and was to come back some day, as I came back, if they would only wait. Did you talk to her, Diamond? No, nobody talks there. They only look at each other, and understand everything. Is it cold there? No. Is it hot? No. What is it, then? You never think about such things there. What a queer place it must be. It's a very good place. Do you want to go back again? No. I don't think I have left it. I feel it here somewhere. Did the people there look pleased? Yes, quite pleased. Only a little sad. Then they didn't look glad. They looked as if they were waiting to be gladder. Some day. This was how Diamond used to answer questions about that country. And now I will take up the story again and tell you how he got back to this country. End of chapter 10